Just to let you know, over the next two weeks, everything that's given to the fish fund is going to go to the Bell family to help them through this time. So remember that when you're writing out your check, when you're giving, that that's going for them. Praise God. Now, some of you may have seen this. Let's set it out right there. It's my wife, so that's the last thing I want that to do is break. Although I did have to dig it out of storage. All right. I want you all to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. I know I just let you sit down. I didn't know how long getting ready was going to take. So if you'll stand with me, we're just going to read a passage of scripture. In Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, one that I actually enjoy very much. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah speaking. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Imagine being in that place. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, and two, with two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Can you imagine that? The worship, the presence, the glory that's being given up to God fills the place with smoke. The doorposts are shaken. And Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts here I am I'm in his presence look how great and how marvelous it is and look at what I am woe is me I'm undone I don't deserve to be here in this room right now then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and he said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send who will go for us Then the man who had just said, woe is me. I don't deserve to be here. The man who said, I have unclean lips. I have problems. I have struggles. When he says, who will go for me? I think he probably looked around. He said, there's nobody else here. Here am I. Send me. You may be seated this morning. I have been in many services in my life, but never one that's described like Isaiah was in. And he sees and he hears the voice of God. You know what strikes me about that passage? God is looking for somebody. He says, whom shall I send? But then he says something that I did not expect. He said, who will go? The uh, question that I would have expected God to ask is I'm looking for somebody, quick, find me who's qualified. Angels that are in my presence praising me. Go find me a good man. Go find me a, 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 a talented man. Go find me a woman gifted with gifts. Go find me somebody who has strength. Go find me somebody who, 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 who everybody will know that that, that person's going to do great things. But that is not what God says. His question is not, bring me the most qualified. His question is, who 
will go. Who will make the choice? Who will say, send me? See, God searches for those who are willing. God searches for those who have a desire. Ezekiel chapter 22, this, the, the verse in, in Isaiah, it's, it's tremendous and it's beautiful. But I'm going to take you to a passage right now that is sad and is horrifying. And yet it also has God looking for somebody. He says, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy. They wrongfully oppress the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. God says, my people are ugly and doing ugly things. And by all rights, they deserve punishment. I'm just looking. I'm looking for one person, one man, one woman who will stand up and say, God, don't punish your people. Give us another chance. Show us some more mercy. Show us some more love. Give give us another opportunity. And he says, I found no one. Therefore, because of that, because I could find nobody to stand in the gap, because I could find nobody to build a wall, I have poured my my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Did you catch it? They deserved punishment. Did, do you realize they deserved punishment? But God was not looking for an opportunity to punish them. He was looking for somebody to say, hey, hey, God, hold on. Hold on. Just, just give them another chance. He was looking for somebody to say, God, give them some mercy. Give them some grace. God's justice called out for punishment, but his mercy said, somebody, somebody give me a reason. Give me a reason to not be just, to show grace, to show mercy. Give me a reason. Just one man, one woman, and an entire nation of people. He finds no one. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but I'll do it myself. The harvest truly is plentiful. You you boys sit down. I got this. The harvest, there's hurting people. There's people who have, need compassion. There's people who need the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. Boys, sit down. I'll take it from here. But that is not what Jesus says. He says the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. In other words, he's saying I'm looking for somebody to use. And unfortunately, there's a great harvest, but there's not a whole lot of people lining up to go out and harvest. There's not a whole lot of people lining up to say, God, send me. Jesus did great things. But there were people that Jesus did not touch. 
and did not heal and did not comfort. Not because he didn't want to, but because there was no one to bring them to Jesus. There was no laborer to go out and say, hey, Mark, there's this man. He's the Messiah. Come see him. There were people he didn't reach, not because he, it was impossible, not because he couldn't, but because there were no laborers or there were not enough laborers. See, I want you to... I, I, I love y'all, all right? God gives us his spirit, and he gives us his spirit for a reason. And let me tell you, that reason is not to sit on a pew and watch a platform. It's a comfortable chair. That's not what he called you to do. But the singing is great. That's not what he called you to do. The preaching, I like it. That's not what he called you to do. See, When God gives power, the power comes with a purpose. God saved you for a reason. I can say, you know what? I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt with every fiber of my being that every single person in this room has a purpose. God has called you for a reason. He's given you the spirit for a reason. You have a purpose. Now, we've got a bunch of folks out there who want to go, no, you're just, you're just random chance and accident. You're just a combination of chemicals and, and, and things. It, it's just a mistake that you're here. You have no reason. You have no purpose. They're wrong. Yeah. You know, in the midst of your sickness, you have a purpose. In the midst of your struggles and your trials, you have a purpose. But the question has never been who is qualified, it's who will. So the question is not can I achieve my purpose? It's never been that. It's will I achieve. My purpose. Will I do what God's called me to do? Not can I do what God's called me to do. It's never been that. What kind of things has God called us to do? Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. To go to church on Sunday and Wednesday. Right? Right? Okay, yeah. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So we could listen to Christian music on the radio. No. For what? I'm sorry? For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, part of your purpose is to do good for people. Walk, that walk in them means this is not just something that you do every once in a while. This is your lifestyle. I'm constantly trying to do good for people. I'm constantly trying to make people's lives better. That's one of his purposes for you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And give you a medal. They say, oh, what a wonderful guy that man is. Know that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I don't do good works so that Kevin can see me and go, oh, what a nice guy. I do good things because I'm hoping. I'm hoping by the love that I show, they'll learn that there's a Savior that loves them. And that they, they'll, they'll come to him because of what I do. John 
John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you. This is the words of Jesus. That you love one another as I have loved you. But you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples. Uh, if you dress in a certain way. This will all men know you're my disciples because you tithe. No. They'll see your love. They will see your love. In order for them to see it, you got to do something with it. There's an old uh, old song. <laughs> so funny because, uh, you know, I was a kid when I listened to it, and so it's hard to realize it's over 20 years old now. There's an old group called DC Talk, and they had a song that said, love is a verb. <laughs> love is something that you do, not something that you have. One of God's purposes is for you to love other people. It hurts my heart when I see people hurting. Men and women that go to church with me hurting people. And a lot of times they don't realize it. A lot of times it's not intentional, but it hurts my heart. Because no one should ever get hurt in church like that. I should learn what love is. Romans chapter 8 Verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. A lot of you have heard this verse, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What is that purpose? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, the purpose is to be like Christ. Now, let's stop and think for a moment. There's a, a hit series out there called The Chosen. I do not expect to find a scene in The Chosen where uh, Jesus cusses out the uh, vendor because he shortchanged him. Pretty sure that's not going to be in there. What did Jesus do? He walked and he demonstrated love. Our purpose is to be like him. He wants you to be like him. Are we going to be perfect, Jackson? Not even close. <laughs> but I want to love somebody that they see Jesus in me. I may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees. You may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees. Who will go? Who will achieve their purpose? Who will stand up and be what God has called them to be? Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So he gave apostles, prophets, teachers not to do the ministry. Is that what that verse said? No, it said to equip the saints to do the ministry. Let me break it down for you. My job, pastor's job, Brother B's job is to get you ready to do what God has called you to do. Listen, there's a good chance I can't reach your family. But I sure can help you be ready to be used to reach your family. But even then, why? 
through the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. Uh, grow up in all, in all things into him who is the head of Christ. The purpose of all of this, the purpose of this building, the purpose of the chair you're sitting on, the purpose of the sound system you're listening to is not to entertain you, is not to make you feel good, it's to help you to grow up to be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. To achieve your purpose. To grow in the image of Christ. To be more and more like him. That word Christian means literally Christ-like. A lot of folks have forgotten that. If you call yourself a Christian, you're wearing an identity tag that says, I'm going to be like Jesus. That's one of our purposes. John, 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. There's coming a day when it's no longer going to be a struggle for me to be like Christ. There's coming a day where I'm going to see him as he is. In that moment, I, I'm going to have an opportunity. Now it's not going to be an, an effort for people to see Jesus in me. They're just going to see him because I see him as he is. And for those of you who wonder, it's not just an Old Testament concept. Actually, this one surprised me. I'm sure I've read the verse before, but I didn't realize it. But in Psalms chapter 17, David says, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness, and I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. David in the Old Testament, before the Holy Ghost, before the church, before all of that, says the only thing that's going to satisfy me, God, is that day when I wake up and I'm just like you. All right. Good works. Be like Christ. Well, if we're supposed to be like Christ, what was Christ's purpose? This next verse that I'm going to read, y'all should know. And if you don't know, you sh- if you don't know and you've been a member of this church for a while, well, we failed you. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. This is Jesus stating what his purpose is. He says, for the Son of Man has come to heal and feed people that are hungry. It doesn't say that. The Son of Man has come to preach and teach and tell people how to be good. Since the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If I'm going to be like him, this is why he came. This is why he robed himself in flesh. It, wasn't, it was not, it was not to, 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 to glorify that, 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 that flesh. It was not to get people to come along and say, oh, what a wonderful man Jesus is. It was not to do that. It was so he could have an opportunity to seek and to save people who were lost. People no one else would touch. Why did Jesus have to walk this earth? He had to go to the lepers who no one else would go to. He had to go to the homes of the tax collectors because nobody would talk to the tax collectors. (laughs) He had to allow the prostitute to wash his feet because nobody wanted to be in the same room as a prostitute. But he was seeking and he was saving that which was lost. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to his disciples, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And we are all of us, every single one of us, one of our purposes is called to share the love of God, to preach the gospel. A lot of messages go on that are not behind this pulpit. A lot of messages are preached that have not a single word in them. (laughs) And I'm thankful. This is also one of my favorite verses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You know what, son? He said you have a purpose, and with a purpose comes something. Do you know what comes with a purpose? Power. My son is shocked that I talked to him. (laughs) Oh, goodness. God has given you power to accomplish your purpose. Why am I so miserable? There's a good chance the reason you're miserable is you're sitting on that power. (laughs) All that power is built up. It's got no place to go but make you uncomfortable. Go stick your finger in a light socket. Find out what happens when power is not used the way it's supposed to be used. Make you uncomfortable, won't it? Brother Tim, I'm not satisfied in my life for God. Are you doing the purpose that he called you to do? Are you willing to go? (laughs) I said that, all of that to come to this point. You know what one of the most common reactions to a call from God was in the Bible? You know what the most, one of the most common reactions to a call from God was in the Bible? Well, let's look at Moses. Moses is out there watching over his father-in-law sheep, goats. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 that he sees a bush that's burning and it's not consumed. And he says, this is a great sight. I will turn aside to look. And as he approaches the bush, a voice comes out and God calls Moses by name and tells him I'm sending you to Egypt to save my people and Moses says awesome let's go Moses said to God who am I (laughs) in other words he said not me man you have got the wrong dude Think about this. This is not Moses' pastor coming to him and saying, hey, I think God's got a purpose for you. This is not Moses' mama telling him, you have, this is Moses seeing the power of God demonstrated. God calling him by name and saying, boy, there's something I need you to do. And Moses' first response, not me. Oh, no. Who am I? How about Gideon? The people of Israel are oppressed by the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. It says, Hail, thou mighty man of valor. I would love for an angel of the Lord to say, Hail, Tim, you mighty man of valor. Ooh, that would make me feel... (laughs) Gideon didn't feel that way. Judges chapter 6. Gideon says, uh, wait a minute. Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Whoa, God, mighty man of valor. My family's small. And not only is my family small and weak, but I'm the weakest. I'm the runt of the litter. You have got the wrong guy. How about Peter? Jesus had just loaded down Peter's boat with the greater catch of fish than he'd ever seen. And the Bible says that when Peter said, all right, God, I'm in. No. That was the point when Peter said to him, Luke chapter 5, verse 8, 
depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Jesus, you've got the wrong guy. None of those men were wrong. None of those men were wrong. Moses was a murderer. Gideon was a coward. (laughs) The laundry list of struggles Peter had. Uh, They they were talking about Mason Langley at his funeral yesterday, and they said he had an alligator mouth and a hummingbird behind In other words, he could run his mouth off, but he couldn't back it up. Peter could run his mouth off, but couldn't back it up. All right. I need some help. Brent, would you help me? Is that all right? Why don't you grab that mirror? We're going to have our musicians come at this time. Kevin, come here. I want you to hold this open just like this. Thank you. The voice of God comes to you and it says, You have a purpose. one of the first things that happens is there's another voice that comes in. Ha! I forgot I looked like that. Look at me. Who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm the I'm the weakest. Damn. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a plan. But, but look. This is a book of my sins. Can't you see how dirty and filthy I've been? Damn, I've got a purpose and a plan for you. But I'm not, I'm not like, you know, coach. I don't have the skills that he has. This blows my mind. But some of you, God has come into your life and he said you've got a purpose. And you've looked in the mirror and decided God doesn't use people like me. People who look this way. Or he's come in and he said, I've got a purpose. And you go, no, God. just too ugly I've made too many mistakes and this is what blows my mind it's possible that he's come into you he said I got a purpose and plan and it's possible brother B that they go but but I'm not brother Tim that blows my mind because you don't want to be me and he doesn't want you to be me Your purpose isn't my purpose. His plan for you isn't what he has planned for me. I want you to stand with me today. Listen. The voice of God is calling this morning. saying who will go who is willing to step out regardless of what you see in the mirror regardless of whether you have bunches of sin or not regardless if you measure up to somebody else that's never been the question Tabby that's never been the question question has always been 
will you go? It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. By all reason, David should have lost when he walked out in that valley. That giant should have smeared him from one end of that valley to the other. And it was not David's skill that saved him. You hear me? It was not David's skill that saved him and allowed him to defeat Goliath. It was because when God said, who will go? David looked around. He said, Aren't, don't you, you're all soldiers. You're all mighty men of valor. You're going to let him talk like that? None of you will go. Then I guess I'm going to have to. My challenge to you this morning. It's possible while I've been speaking, God has been dealing with you about your purpose. I'd ask you to gather with me at the front this morning. Not because you're talented. Not because you're perfect. Not because you measure up. But because you're just simply saying, God's called. I'm willing. Or if you're not willing, are you willing to be made willing? Is there anybody in this place who's willing to be made willing this morning, who's willing to say, God, you're looking for somebody. (laughs) I don't understand how it could be me. I think you got the wrong one, but you know what? I'll go. I'll step out and face the giant. I'll love somebody that that no one else will love. I'll scrub a toilet because it needs to be scrubbed. I'll teach a Sunday school class even though I need to be taught. I'll drive a a van even though I might have to sacrifice a bit of my Sunday morning if I can reach some kids that need to know God. I will. If no one else will, I will. Father, in this house right now, so much purpose, God. Help us to see and help us to be willing, Jesus, to go, willing to step out, willing to to serve, willing to do what you've called us to do, willing to be what you've called us to be. Get a hold of us, God. Change us. I'm willing, Jesus. A lot of times I feel like you've made a mistake, but I'm willing. I'll step out. I'll go. I'll stand in the gap. I'll build a wall. I'll be a laborer. be worth much but everything I have I'll give to you I'm willing Jesus I ask you this morning are you willing if you're willing would you come forward if you're willing to be made willing would you come forward this morning is there anybody who says whatever God wants me to do I'll do Wherever he wants me to go, I'll go. Whoever he wants me to love, I'll love. Wherever he wants me to serve, I'll serve. I'll do whatever, Jesus. As they begin to sing, reach out to him. Let him speak to your heart this morning. Let him speak to your heart this morning. Jesus, I
yesterday at Chris's funeral, I reviewed the story of Lazarus, Jesus' friend being raised from the dead and the message that I've been given and I believe, I believe it's correct. I've always wondered when Jesus wept who he was weeping for. Was he weeping for Lazarus? He was about to raise him from the dead. Was he weeping for Mary and Martha? For he was about to give them the best gift they'd ever received, their brother back to life. Or was he, whenever he called for Lazarus to be raised from the dead, whenever he said, Lazarus, come forth, was he weeping for all of those that would be left in the tomb? And I said that again to say this. Somebody listen to me today. Somebody listen to me today. It was just recently revealed to me for just a few seconds how much God loves us. God allowed me to feel the compassion that he has moved with for about 15 seconds on someone who was in a mighty bad way. And I'll tell you, I've, I've never felt a love so deep in my life. And I've said that to say this, you, you don't serve a God who is just sitting on a throne making laws and dictates. You have a God that loves you more than you will ever imagine. You have a God that is moved with compassion when he looks upon you, even if you are in your lowest estate. Whenever you're the lowest that you've ever been, whenever you have committed more sin than you think you could ever be forgiven of, God is moved with compassion. And He delights in forgiving His people. He delights in giving you mercy. And you know what? You can look, you can look the part, you can, you can dress like a Christian, and I hope you do. You can give your money. Anchor, you're in the middle. You hold it all together. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You're in the middle. You hold it all together. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Let's go out and find somebody to love. Find somebody to love.